We had something that you wanted to discuss before we got uh, on the call. You know, um, the Austin bomber. Uh, we had this guy running around in Austin. For those of you who haven't heard, uh, we had a guy running around in Austin setting off bombs. And he, he pretty much uh, terrorized the city for about three weeks, and they caught him. Um, the FBI, local police, ATF uh, did a phenomenal job um, pursuing this guy and, and catching him. And uh, it, it's, it's one of those, um, let's see, if you compare it to how uh, quickly they caught this guy compared to some of the other um, people that have done things like this, mm -hmm. it was pretty phenomenal. I mean, it took them, what, five years or so to catch Eric Rudolph? I can't remember now. But. It took forever to get the Unabomber. But yeah, it took a long time. And, but you know, this guy was dropping more bombs faster than uh, Kaczynski ever did. Yeah. Um, there was, a, there was I, I know there's points that you want to get to. Uh, there, there's a couple things to of note. Uh, his name was Mark, and he attended the Austin Stone Church. A bunch of people who are familiar with the show to go, oh my gosh, is this Mark from Stone Church who used to call yeah. all the time? Uh, no. Uh, because that guy, Mark from Stone Church, was a prank caller, which we've mentioned several times on the show in the past. Uh, I actually got to, to meet and interact and had lunch with one of the associate pastors at the time for Austin Stone Church, and we talked about that. The church had no issues. Everything that Mark had said about it, it's like he like picked a church out of a phone book. Yeah. And he wasn't even, I don't even think he was in the States. When, no, I think he, I don't even think time. But. Like, I don't know. Anyway. Somewhere in Europe, Scandinavia, yeah. whatever. Uh, so people immediately were like, oh my gosh, was this the same person? Uh, no. And then the next thing that happened is that there's a video which hasn't been released as far as I know um, that essentially amounts to a confession and lists a number of other targets. And people were asking, you know, oh, are, were you guys on the target? I have no idea. Uh, yeah. It would surprise me, uh, at least a little bit, but what would surprise me most is the fact that as far as I know, none of us have been contacted by law enforcement to say that, you know, hey, watch out for packages on your doorstep. But there were a lot of other problems with this, too, and that's one of the things that, that Jen and I wanted to get to. So Yeah, so people um, initially, his, his first few bombs were set off in East Austin. And the neighborhood in East Austin is predominantly black and Hispanic. So odds are very high if you are doing something in East Austin, it's going to impact black and Hispanic people more than white people. And so uh, th he uh, killed two black people, um, injured a Hispanic woman, and I think um, there were, I think, were there two other people who were injured on, in East Austin? I think so. I, I don't, well, I was traveling for a yeah. bunch of this. So anyway, um, or, or maybe there was only one other person in East Austin. But anyway, it was predominantly black or Hispanic people who were affected um, initially in, in East Austin. And everyone said, oh, it's racially motivated. And Immediately, the, by, by it, the time the third right. bomb went off. And, and in fact, we didn't know that, because unless you know what the, the bomber's motives are, um, you can't make that assessment. And as I, I pointed out to someone who is, who's suggesting this, is that, hey, at the time he started, South by Southwest was going on. So if you wanted to avoid cameras and a heavy police presence, you wouldn't go west of I-35 you'd stay east of I-35, because there's not as many cameras or police over there during South by Southwest. And of course, as soon as South by Southwest ended, the fourth bomb uh, was set off, and that was in, the, in Southwest Austin, which is a completely different demographic, um, and it injured two white people. And this is about the time that people started to hear, uh, at least people outside of Austin and Texas started to pay attention to this, and. And a lot of people jumped on the bandwagon. Oh, well, he's killing you know, minorities, and the news isn't covering it because it's not white people. And in fact, the news was covering it. You know, I haven't heard about it yet. It does not mean the news is not, you know, that the media is not covering it. Um, Actually, I heard about it on Twitter from yeah. somebody who doesn't live in Austin um, after the second or third bomb, because there were like two right. in one day right. that became two and three. Yeah, so um, when the, I was actually traveling um, in, uh, I was up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area when I heard about the second and third bombs. Mm. And the fact is, that w when the first bomb went off, the police initially thought it was 
um, retaliation by a drug cartel and that they got the wrong address. And so, you know, you have a data point of one, so it's pretty hard to connect that dot to something, you know, concrete. And so they, they really, the news did report it, but it wasn't as a, oh, hey, there's a serial bomber, because at that point it was just one. Uh, then when, when the second and third bombs went off, that's when media coverage started to ramp up outside of the Austin area. Yeah, and I think I saw it on CNN that yeah. day after after somebody tweeted me. They were, they were like, please give us updates. And I'm like, updates on, yeah, on what? what? Um, and there were a bunch of interesting things about this, and there are a number of problems. One is there are people who are upset about how the news media has talked about this individual mm -hmm. uh, and have pointed out that had this individual been black, the language used to describe yeah. him, oh, this wouldn't have been, this was a troubled kid. Uh, and I completely agree with that, that that's been the trend. Mm -hmm. It's just that my preference would not be to talk about either of them as anything more than what the facts indicate. You know, yeah. hey, this is a troubled kid. We don't necessarily know motivations yet. We should, we should be honest. This is, it's awful, it's repugnant, but don't pretend to know the motivations before right. we have that. And we should stop... Um, you know, it's like I was telling Jim beforehand, if, if the argument is, hey, we're paying, you know, the average white kid more than we're paying the average black kid, the solution isn't to pay the white kid less, it's to pay both of them more. Right. Uh, and I, you know, I, I kind of go down that road, but it, it's been frustrating because there's a number of other things that happen, including the shooting of a 20-year-old uh, young black male in his backyard. Right. Um, and there seems to always be an example to point to, to say, hey, here's a big problem. Mm -hmm. It's it's undeniable, uh, the people who think that we're in some sort of post-racial society, you're just wrong. I mean, just because we don't have, you know, or at least we don't have as many yet, uh, incidents of like the KKK burning crosses and stuff like that, doesn't mean that we're in any way post-racial. And there was a really good study I saw uh, out of Harvard that talked about, and they tried to normalize for as many factors as they could, uh, but they, they sampled 20 million kids, and of those that started off rich, um, the white kids and the black girls managed to stay rich at a relatively decent percentage, but black males trended towards becoming poor. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the different possible hypotheses that I was presented with for why this is, um, are a little too over the edge for me to even bother going into on the show. But it's undeniable that there's a problem here, and it is a problem about young black men being treated fundamentally different from everybody else. Mm -hmm. At, not in every case. You can point to exceptions here and there. Right. But as, as a trend, as a norm, this is just the case. The how and why behind it, that's more difficult and is what takes effort because nobody likes to think they're racist, even though you are. You are every, every damn one of you, all of us. You've got yes. some bias and baggage and prejudice somewhere. You may not be the worst thing. You might be relatively aware of it. You may be working to overcome it, but don't sit around and pretend that you know, you're not racist. I mean, I remember Tony Penn uh, was one of the first ones to, to kind of raise my awareness of this notion of people saying, oh, I don't see color. Yeah. That's absolute garbage. It's, you, you do. it's deeply problematic. You not only so see it, you hear it. You, you hear it on the phone and it changes this. Oh, I, I recognize this style of talking. I, I'm, I'm going to put this person in a category and that's going to fundamentally change everything I do. Well, the other, the other problem for me with, with people that say I don't see color is that this is um, a way for them to make the uh, disparate treatment of of black men in particular uh, versus everybody else, it's a way for them to make that not what it is by denying that there's a fundamental difference in how they're treated from the time they're growing up until they get into the, their work life and professional life. There are differences. And if you deny that, then you can then come back and claim that whatever unequal outcomes they experience, it must be something they did. Yeah. You know, it can't be that, that structurally there's this problem. And so that I don't see color thing, that's just bullshit. And, and there's no reason to think that, that the problem is something that is overt or explicit. It could be right. something implicit 
within the structure of society where we've built up to this dynamic. Uh, and it's going to take a lot of effort to dig through. But there, there were a couple other things um, about Mark and, and how he was spoken about. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it came out that he was um, homeschooled by, you know, Christian, probably fundamentalist parents. Mm -hmm. um, and people, so far, they've not called him a terrorist. They've not said he was radicalized and, you know, that... Um, I don't know. It's it's almost like if if he were Muslim, we'd be having a completely different conversation about this. Yeah. He would have been called a terrorist. He would have they, they would have been said, saying that he was radicalized that because he went to this madrasa. Well, this guy, it's possible that he was educated in what amounts to a Christian madrasa. We don't know. Uh, we don't know why his parents chose to homeschool him. Apparently, they homeschool all their kids. Um, I know people that homeschool their kids uh, because their kids have some kind of special need and the, they don't feel like the public school system can adequately meet those needs. I know other people that homeschool their kids, particularly religious parents, because they don't want their children exposed to any kind of thoughts that would challenge their religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. In fact, for the majority of the Christian homeschoolers, that's the attitude I see most often, is that they don't want their kids' beliefs challenged. Um, and then, you know, there are some who do it because the family likes to travel a lot and that gives them more flexibility. And there's a lot of different reasons. We don't really know why he was homeschooled. Um, and we don't really know what the content of his Christian homeschooling was. And for, um, for clarity, what we're talking about here is the difference in the way this is discussed. Yeah. It, it's entirely possible that his homeschooling and his... Uh, Christian camp stuff uh, didn't play a part in this. And that's the part of the problem is we don't know. We don't know what yeah. the motivations are. We don't know who, who the additional targets were. Um, and and my, my goal is to always make sure we're talking about it fairly. But it's worth recognizing that it is a virtual certainty that had this been reversed, had this been a Muslim child instead of or a Christian child or 20 year old, however old he was. Um, 23. There'd be a lot, the conversation would be dramatically different. Yeah. And that has to do with the fact that we in the United States live in a culture where Christian is somehow synonymous with good, better, preferential, normal, uh, American, and all of these other things that, that, that go into how we assess these situations, which are, by the way, all garbage. Yeah. Well, and, and that's another thing that's kind of disturbing. He's being described in a lot of circles as, well, he was just a normal kid. It's like, no, he was not normal. It is not normal to build bombs and then go off and set them off, leave them on people's doorsteps, not knowing who you're going to kill or whatever, to put one on a tripwire next to a hike and bike trail that's used by lots of people. You know, those things are not normal. So in no sense of the word was he normal. And the terrorist label yeah. and the discussions around that. To be sure, what he did amounts to terrorism. Yeah. If you're looking at it from here's what the effect was. Right. That may be separate from what his goal was. Uh, this, I, I could certainly envision someone who has, for whatever reason, even with no anger or malice, has just become fascinated with, I'm going to blow shit up. Yeah. And starts doing this. Uh, and it's not so much a goal of causing terror, it's that I'm okay if this causes terror as well. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, he could have been just a garden variety sociopath and, you know. And we apologize to all the garden variety sociopaths who, who have never and would never do anything like this. Right. <laughs> it, it's, it's just been frustrating. You know, I traveled a lot. There were a lot of conversations around it. Um, and, of course, it's going to go to religious differences, racial differences, we're gonna assume motivations, we're gonna look at how this person's treated differently, and many of those criticisms are incredibly fair uh, and certainly indicative of a problem that we need to address. Uh, but there are individuals in all these situations who take the ball and go about 50 yards past the goal line in order to make, you know, because they have a particular pet issue, and let me, mm -hmm. let me form this into that. Well, and, so. and, and having said all that, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that he probably was radicalized by something in his background. And I base that on the fact that they did find a blog 
post where he talked about um, very conservative views. In particular, he, he railed against, um, you know, homosexuality and same-sex marriage and stuff. And so um, there was something in there that radicalized him. I mean, you know, what the, again, what his specific targets were, what his motivations were for the bombings, I don't know. But um, I think it's, you know, it's 2018. It's time to recognize that being opposed to um, marriage equality and um, equal civil rights for, um, for everyone, it, that's a fringe idea. Um, and if you don't agree with that, then, then you're pretty much on the radical fringe. Yep.